Phil, good morning, welcome. Uh, it's a bit of a funny morning for all of us than I thought it would be. Uh, but it's uh, an opportunity to worship the Lord and to come together around his word. As we do so, I'm going to read Psalm 110 to begin. Psalm 110, it's entitled a Psalm of David. It has an impact on what we are looking at in a short while in John's Gospel. So Psalm 110, a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. He shall lift up the head. So reads God's word. Let's pray. Lord and our God, we thank you now that we are able to gather together here in your presence. We thank you that those at home watching are able to gather with us in your presence. We pray now that as we do so, whether we are here in this building or in our own homes, that we will know that presence of the Spirit. We pray that the distance that is necessary at such a time as this will not be an obstacle to us worshipping you and knowing your presence. We thank you indeed that you are the infinite and eternal God and that you are everywhere. There is no place we can be that you are not, for you are the omnipresent God. We thank you that David, when he wrote the 139th Psalm, knew that, that there was no place he could go throughout this world, not into the grave, not into hell itself. You are everywhere. And we thank you for that. We praise you that where we are now is in your presence. So we ask that as we worship you together now, that you will be with us, you will help us, and that your name will be magnified. And for the glory of your name and according to your word and promise, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a hymn. Number one. There is a hymn in here with 12 verses, but I thought we'd miss that one out. We're going to sing number one. It's based on Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with fear, his praise foretell, come ye before him and rejoice.
Let's come before the Lord in prayer again. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come into your presence, we are coming before one, though you are holy and just and majestic and pure and righteous and glorious, magnificent in your person and presence, yet we come before you and we cry out, Father. We thank you that we have been brought into this most personal of relationships with you, made your children by grace. And so it is that we come before you now and we can pour our hearts out before you in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we pray for our nation at this time. We pray that you will grant to those who lead us in government, those who are in the commons and lords, indeed to our royal family, great wisdom and courage in this time, that they will lead the country wisely, that they will be enabled to put the health of the nation first, and as a result, that by your grace, this time of trial will pass, and that we will be able to go forward to serve you in gladness of heart. We thank you and we praise you that you are indeed sovereign. There is nothing that happens in this world but is not according to your providence and according to your eternal decree. We praise you therefore that this situation, though it seems to have caught so many by surprise as the months have gone by and as the days of this last week have gone by, seems to have grown in intensity, yet it is all known to you from before the beginning. We praise you and we thank you that such is your knowledge. And indeed, you know the end of all things. And so we thank you that we can trust in you as a result. There is nothing unknown to you, all things known to you. And therefore we can rest in your sovereign hand, knowing that you rule. You rule our days, you rule our times, you rule among the nations, you rule in time and eternity. And so we give you thanks and praise for that. We pray for those today who are struggling. There will be those, uh, Father of your children. Indeed, there will be those amongst uh, our fellow citizens in this nation who will be struggling with being shut in, especially the elderly, feeling their loneliness and their separation from family and friends. Strengthen them, Lord, we pray. Be with your children who are shut in today. May they know your presence and your help. Lord, we think of those who will be struggling with this virus, some perhaps serious. We pray that again amongst your children that your grace will be very evident. And we pray for all that your hand will be upon them. We pray, Lord, that you will help those who are scared and fearful. And Lord, especially again amongst us as your children, that you will remove all fear. And rather that we will be lost in your love and we'll be lost in wonder of you, and that there will be no room for fear. Indeed, give us a heart of courage that we might minister to others, that your name might be glorified. Lord, we pray for your children who are in difficult situations. We think of a dear brother who is stuck in a foreign country, seeking to come home before the airports close down. We pray that you will have your hand upon him, that you will bring him back safely to his family and fellowship. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world where they too are struggling with the same virus. We think especially of Ruth and the fellowship at Ati, that you will be with them, keep them, bless them. Lord, may your word be preached with a comfort and a joy there. May our brother know your presence and may your people be enlarged in wonder of you and love for you and service toward you. Lord, wherever your people meet, be with them. Be magnified and glorified now, we ask, as we come to your word, for your name's sake. Amen. Well, please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We're going to read the first 11 verses. A week ago, I was not intending to preach. Indeed, we were to have another brother here. Um, but as the week has gone on, I felt that perhaps I ought to start planning something out. So we're going to look uh, this morning at some of the verses here in John 14. It's the upper room discourse where our Lord is speaking to his disciples. It's the night he's about to be arrested. And we read John 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me, that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So reads God's Word. Well, I want us to look at verses 8 through to 11 of John 14 under the heading, Seeing the Unseen. Seeing the Unseen. The modern way of thinking amounts to this. I won't believe unless I see, and even then I probably won't believe. It's almost the Thomas Syndrome, except it's a little bit worse. Most modern people, even when you show them the truth, are not really interested in it. Why? Well, because as far as most modern people are concerned, there is no objective truth, no absolute standard of truth. The only truth that suits their way of thinking is their own truth, whether it is substantial or not. But the Gospel is about seeing the unseen. But by grace, it is seeing the ultimate truth, the ultimate truth in time and in eternity. It is about seeing our God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is himself the eternal Son of God. Let's begin by considering human hubris, human hubris. Here is Philip in verse 8. He turns to our Saviour. It's on the back of something that Jesus has said. Jesus said, I am going, you know where I'm going, and you know the way. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going, and therefore we can't know the way. How can we? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip then turns and says, Lord, show us the Father. And it's enough, it's sufficient for us. Now, as a Jew, Philip knew that God could not be seen. He knew that God is spirit. And in fact, he would have known that you cannot see God and live because of the absolute holiness of God. So Philip must have known, in essence, he was asking the impossible. Yet Jesus had said, from now on, you, you know the Father and have seen him. Show us the Father. You can't see God. How could Philip even think that it was somehow possible to see God? And yet, hadn't Jesus said to him, You have seen the Father, and now you know the Father? Was perhaps Philip guilty of over-enthusiasm? We can be like that, can't we? Over-enthusiasm. Or perhaps he was guilty of being earnest, but having absolutely no understanding. And perhaps in that we see something of the common human hubris, making demands of God as though God could dance to our tune. Because we do have a tendency as human beings to think we are the centre of everything. I am the centre of the world and everything must revolve around me. We are all important. And yes, in one sense we are. God in Scripture has clearly demarcated every human being as of incredible worth and value in his estimation. We are created as human beings, every one of us, 
in the image of God. That's what Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 says. We are created in God's image. We have what the theologians call the Imago Dei, which simply means the image of God. That's what we bear. But what happens is that we can tend to replace the truth of the revealed God with human hubris, with our self-importance, with our self-adoration and our self-absorption. We're absorbed by ourselves. And it changes everything because we begin to demand the impossible. We begin to place ourselves at the center and make demands of God. We demand that God does this. We demand that God does that. We expect God to dance to our tune. It's dangerous as it leads us away from God, and it is sin. We need to be careful that we are not guilty of human hubris. Even during days such as ours, where we are being encouraged to observe social distancing, where our normal lives are being curtailed by closures, we need to be careful that we are not guilty of human hubris, of making ourselves the center of the universe and of making unreasonable demands on God, expecting Him to dance to our tune. We need, therefore, to examine our thinking before God, our heart. Who is reigning on the throne of our heart? Is it you or is it God? What about our actions? Do our actions reflect the fact that the Lord is reigning on the throne of our heart? Or does it reflect that we are reigning? What about our focus? For many of us, perhaps now we will spend days shutting the house. Where is our focus going to be? Well, if the Lord is reigning in our hearts, he will naturally become our focus. We need to examine ourselves before the Lord and before his word lest we become guilty in our hearts of human hubris. There is something perhaps of that here, a lack of understanding, a lack of seeing. Because the second thing I want to see here is human blindness. You see, Philip heard what Jesus said. Philip saw Jesus saying it. What did he see? Well, he saw the rabbi he had followed for the last few years. He saw the man who sat at that Passover table with him. The man who had preached, the man who had taught with authority. He saw the man who had healed the sick, who he'd even seen raise the dead, Lazarus, not so long ago, called from the grave. He saw the man in front of him. Jesus had just said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now, on, from now on you know him and have seen him. Yet Philip only saw the man. He only saw the man. What Philip should have seen was the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. He should have seen the second person of the triune Godhead, God incarnate as a man, the Emmanuel, God with us. He should have seen the Word who was with God, because he was God. The man who is God, who had preached and taught with authority, his own authority, who had healed the sick and even raised the dead. He should have seen the sovereign Messiah. Why didn't he? You would think being in Jesus' very presence at that moment of all moments, he would have got it. He would have understood. He would have seen it. But Philip is as nonplussed as all the rest of them. Why didn't he see what he should have seen? Well, very simply, he needed his eyes open. The same as every person born into the world needs their eyes spiritually open. I don't know if you've seen those videos in the internet of people given glasses so they're able to see colour for the first time. Almost invariably they end up amazed and there are a few tears as they see colour. Can you imagine seeing a world in greys, never seeing colour? And then for the first time in your life through modern technology being able to see colour. Having your eyes open to the wonder of the world around us. Spiritually. 
spiritually, we need more than that. We need our eyes open, for we are blind. Philip needed to see the living God. He needed the living God to open his eyes, therefore, to open the eyes of his understanding, his spiritual eyes. He needed his eyes open as much as the two on the road to Emmaus a few days later needed their eyes open. Jesus had walked with them. Jesus had taught them. And then Jesus had taken the bread and broken the bread. And only then were their eyes open. And they saw that this was the risen Jesus. The reason Philip here didn't see was spiritual human blindness. Why don't people see spiritual reality today? Why is it that when you tell a person they're a sinner, they kick out against it? Because they don't like the idea of sin. They don't like the idea of God. They don't like the idea they need a saviour. Why is it that people don't see the truth of spiritual reality? It's nothing to do with COVID-19. The fact is that people, every one of us born into this world, we are spiritually blind. We are lost in sin. It's our natural condition. That's what we're bound in. We are therefore rebels against God. We're fighting against the sovereign. And we're fighting the battle that's already lost. We are breakers of God's laws. We are, we are outlaws. Who will inevitably be called to justice. And so many even deny the very person of God himself. Yes, people are sinful and spiritually blind. And the truth is it suits the devil to keep people entertained in that situation, in that state of mind. So long as people are held in entertainment or held in fear, that's fine. So far as the devil is concerned. That's why as a Christian today, it is so important that you pray. That you use your time to pray that the Lord would open eyes and open hearts. Many people are being challenged to consider the reality of our society today. You go on Facebook and you have a look what people are saying about the way others are behaving and people are beginning to question the very fabric and foundation of our society. Why are people behaving like this? What's going on? Pray that their eyes would be open. Pray that they begin to look for real answers. That God by his grace would open the eyes of many and they would see for the first time the truth of the gospel. Pray that the Holy Spirit would shake the comfortable and awaken the spiritual slumber. Pray for people then to see the truth. Even at government level. Even our Prime Minister. That he would see the spiritual truth. His eyes would be open. Pray that we would find ways then to hold out the truth of the gospel to others around us. No, we might not be able to do the things only two weeks ago we were doing. But there are other ways, other means, and pray that we would take those as we find them, so that others would hear the gospel. Perhaps you're at home and you say, well, I've no longer got access to literature. Well, contact one of us, and one of us will bring literature out to you, deliver it to you. But pray. Pray for people to have their spiritual eyesight restored, to be awakened to their need, their state before God, and that the only answer is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace. So here is human hubris. Here is human blindness. What does Jesus do? Well, first, Jesus shows divine grace. Isn't it interesting in verse 9, Jesus doesn't tell Philip off. He doesn't say to Philip, Philip, you should know this. Go back to your notes and check what I taught you over the last three years. He doesn't tell him off. He asks Philip a question. There's no rebuke here that's designed to crush Philip, but rather Jesus gently probing Philip's thinking, leading Philip forward. Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? That is a gentle question in probing you. A question that Jesus himself answers as we go forward through these verses. And he answers it by pointing to himself. You see, instead of 
dismissing Philip or, or belittling Philip. Jesus showed him great grace. This is divine grace. It's the same sort of grace he showed to the woman at the well of Sychar. It's the same sort of grace he showed to the parents bringing the children. Divine grace. Okay? The, the grace that's patient with us, that's gentle with us, that's kind with us, that leads us forward. And he corrects Philip's thinking. And he points Philip to himself. He who has seen me has seen the Father, said Jesus. Now just as Jesus dealt with Philip in this manner, so he deals with us in divine grace. He deals with us in divine grace. And it's so important we remember that, because how are we to view ourselves in this current virus situation? The Lord points us to himself. He points us to himself. Here are the powerful and the rich and the influential. Here there are the great nations and empires of the world. Here are the great minds and the thinkers exerting all their power and strength. And yet in his sovereign decree, God humbles them all with the smallest of things, a tiny virus, a tiny virus. And what is God doing? He's saying to you and I as children of God, I'm sovereign. I'm sovereign. I'm in control. I am the sovereign God. I am the judge. All that are accountable to me. I raise up the judges of the earth. I bring up the judges of the earth, Lord. I move nations where I want them. The times and the seasons are at my command. And it's into that situation that the gospel invitation is given. Because our sovereign is our saviour. The gospel invitation comes with his sovereignty. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me, know your sin dealt with. Know you're being made right with God. Know that you have eternal life in me, says Jesus. You see, into the void that exists in society today, the gospel of Christ shines with divine grace. Not one of us deserves divine grace. We can't command divine grace. And yet grace comes to us. And it shines more brilliantly the darker the day gets. The answer is in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You need to look to Jesus, to the Saviour. And look to him. The story is told of Spurgeon on a winter's day. Not able to get to the church he would normally have gone to. And went into a Methodist church in the vicinity of Colchester. The preacher hadn't arrived, and it was a man who perhaps should never have been in the pulpit who was preaching. And he took a text from Isaiah, look and live. And that's pretty much all he said, and he kept saying it over and over to Spurgeon in different ways. Look to the Lord Jesus, young man, look and live. By the grace of God, Spurgeon was saved that day. You, like Spurgeon, can know your sin dealt with. You can know eternal life within because of divine grace. You can know that you are a child of God and that all things are new because of divine grace. We mustn't put our sin before coming to Jesus. We must rather come to him now and look and live. We need to see the truth. Yes, we need to see our sin. We need to see the reality of God's judgment we are under. We need to see also his great provision for our sinners under his judgment. His provision in the cross. His provision in the resurrection, in the ascension. We need to therefore call people to repent of their sin and believe in Jesus to be saved. That's God's divine grace to sinners, salvation, full and free. And what to us as Christians then? Well, we have this comfort. Having experienced the divine grace of salvation, what do we find? That our Saviour is the sovereign God. He is ruling. He is reigning. And he is reigning until all are put under his feet. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Even today, in this situation, he is sovereign and reigning. And that kind of certainty for us is divine grace. And we are reminded of it this day. We have such confidence, such assurance as the children of God. 
And yes, the Lord may probe our thinking at times like this. Even as he does, he gives us the answer himself. Himself. Aren't we so limited as individuals? Well, we can be ever so clever. I don't know if you've met somebody who's really bright, really brilliant. Perhaps you know your field of expertise. Then you meet somebody who makes you feel like a minnow. Makes you feel really small because they seem to know far more. And then if you take them onto an unrelated topic, they know no more than you. We are so limited, aren't we? So small in our thinking. Yet here is our Saviour God, the Sovereign, who is infinite. High over all. He is the one who reigns in his sovereign power. That's why we trust him as his people. And there is no fear for us in trusting the Lord. There is no regret in trusting the Lord. And such is his divine grace to us as his children that we can trust him and know peace and security. Yes, for a time now as a fellowship, most, as a fellowship, most of us will find ourselves separated. It's a situation none of us want. We don't want to be separated as the Lord's people. We want to be together on a Lord's Day morning. But even though this is now enforced upon us for a time, is the Lord still with us? Yes. Is the Lord still sovereign? Yes. Does his peace remain with us? Yes. His divine grace is still poured out on us. And yes, we may look to and long for the day when we are able to meet again face to face and shake hands without wondering whether we should die for the sink to wash them immediately. And even as we look forward to that day, we can look forward to that greater day, can't we? That day when we will stand around the throne of God and of the Lamb with people of every tribe, tongue and nation and we will praise him with one voice. What a day that's going to be, isn't it? Can you imagine what that would be like when we stand before him and praise him? See our Saviour, and we are clothed in his righteousness. What divine grace he shows us. The final thing I want us to see then is divine revelation. The answer to, to human hubris. The answer to all our Pride as human beings, all our pomposity and all our problems to our spiritual blindness and blankness and darkness is divine grace and divine revelation. Because Jesus says something really quite amazing in verse 10. He says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? He goes on to say in verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Now, I wish we had time this morning to open this up fully. What he is not saying, he is not saying, is that he, the Son, and the Father are the same person. There is a clear distinction of persons here. Father and Son. And in fact, if you go back to John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. In the Greek it's hologos and theos, without the article. So you have the Word and God. And the reason it's written that way is not because somehow God is lesser. It's because the Word is God and yet He is separate. There is one God, yet three persons. One being of God, and yet the three persons are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God. What we find ourselves being drawn to here in Jesus' response to Philip is an opening up of the teaching of the triune Godhead. To say that the Father and the Son, and indeed the Spirit, are the same person. That's the grievous heresy of modalism. Oneness churches, as they call themselves, are still around us and they fall into this heresy. What Jesus is saying is simply this. There is an interconnectedness between him as the person of the Son and the person of the Father. The Father is with the Son, the Son is with the Father at all times. There is this eternal fellowship, eternal love, eternal interconnectedness. There is that point where they meet, if you will. They are one God, yet three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. 
Father and Son here are both equally and eternally fully God, but only one God. The Father sent the Son, yes, and the Son chose to come, yes, he humbled himself. The Father and Son now have sent the Spirit, and yes, each has a different role to play in the plan of redemption, yet they are of one purpose, <coughs> willing the same thing. And Jesus' words and actions then are in full agreement with the Father, so Jesus could point to his miracles and say to Philip, believe me, for the sake of the works themselves. Believe me, for the things I've done, because the Father is in me working, and I am in the Father. He is saying to Philip what he told John in, what John told us in the opening 18 verses of this Gospel, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, that it is only the eternal Son who has revealed the Father to us. And right there in that upper room, Jesus reveals the truth to him, to Philip. There is divine revelation. Jesus opens up the triune Godhead. Now I would invite us all as the Holy Spirit takes his word this morning to see who it is who has saved us. We didn't save ourselves by the actions we exercise. It wasn't our decisions that saved us. Who saved us? It was God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three persons of the one God active in saving you. There is one God, there is one salvation, there is one will. It is the will of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. It is God, the triune God, who saves you. And Jesus is inviting Philip and the others, and us, to look at him this morning. You want to know the Father? See me. Who has revealed the Father? I reveal the Father. The Father is me. In me, I am in the Father. Jesus says, look at me. Look at me. And we need to look then at the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he? He is the incarnate Son of God. He came into this world. He humbled himself, as Paul says in Philippians 2. He becomes our Saviour going to the cross to die for us. And he is the Lord. He has now the name which is above every name. And that at his name every knee will bow, every tongue will confess he is Lord. And yet he is the pure one who died for us. The Holy One. And it's in this that we find our hope and our joy. The world around us may not see what we see. Our friends and our family around us may not appreciate what we appreciate this morning. And yet we know God has revealed to us the glorious truth of the gospel. Though we didn't deserve it, he has shown us the wonder of the Saviour's love. Though we would never have comprehended it by ourselves, he's shown us the greatness of our Saviour's majesty. By divine revelation, because of the operation of the Spirit this morning, because you're a child of God, you can see the unseen. By faith, you can see more than Philip ever did that evening in the upper room. What Philip would come to see and understand in the days to come, by grace, has been revealed to you. What grace he shows us by such divine revelation, by showing us our Saviour as the eternal Son who came to die for us, rose for our justification, ascended to be our great High Priest and is coming again to take us home. As we sit at home in the coming days and weeks, we shouldn't fret. As we listen to the news, we shouldn't fret and worry. Here is our Saviour and here is our Lord. He's the one we should fix on. He's the one we should look at. It's what he has done for us in his own person that should fill our hearts and our minds. And so we should live for him. We do all for his glory now, even in what we think of as peculiar situations such as ours, where we are at home and not able to go out. We do all for his glory, nevertheless. He has shown us great grace by revealing this divine truth to us. This gospel of grace.
grace in the person of the sovereign Saviour, the eternal Son. So we should live for his glory, trusting him, knowing his sovereign will shall be accomplished. Yes, we need to live for him today as we will have the opportunity and it will be in new and perhaps different ways. But as we have those opportunities, speak to him, speak of him rather to others. Bear witness to him. Take the opportunity to share the gospel by email, by text, by phone call. Perhaps even over the back fence, where you have to observe social distancing. Be part of what God may yet do through a time such as this. Be a part of God revealing the same wonder of divine truth in the gospel to others. Be part of God opening somebody else's eyes and drawing them to the Saviour. Share the gospel. Point to Christ and pray that others will see the unseen. The joy of sin forgiven. A heart made right with God. Indwelt by the Spirit children of God on the way home to glory. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's take our hymn books. We're going to sing 898. We should know the tune, but I don't think we've ever sung this one before. Uh, it, it is there as number three, but never mind. They switched this up off. Okay. Well, we're going to stand to sing 898. Now to him who loved us, gave us every pledge, pledge that love could give, freely shed his blood to save us, gave his life that we might live, be the kingdom and dominion and the glory evermore. The tune is la 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 Let's start the singing. Now to him who loved us, So, Lord, may we this day fix our eyes upon you, and to you be all.